Okay, um, my name is Matt. Uh, I'm just going to lead uh, today's um, introduction. Uh, this is a CG uh, platform for big data socioeconomic community of practice webinar. Um, uh, it's the harmonization of COVID-19 phone surveys in the CG. Um, so Gideon, who leads the community of practice, will uh, make the introductions and introduce the speakers today. Uh, following that, if you have any questions, any of the attendees have questions, uh, you can just put them in the question section uh, on your panel on, and we'll have time after the presentations to answer any clarifying questions and then there will be a half an hour discussion uh, about, uh, in a broader sense, about the about harmonisation across the board and what um, conclusions we can come to. Gideon? Yeah. Okay. You, yeah, the, there we go. Okay. Hello. Welcome to this, uh, to this webinar, um, uh, which is organized by the Community of Practice on Socioeconomic Data. Um, it, we have a very nice panel, panel today. And um, let me start by quickly introducing the, the topic. Um, it is about harmonization, and what I'd like to start doing is have a quick, uh, to, uh, a, a, a quick definition of what we mean by harmonization. Uh, and to do that, I have to back up a few steps and talk about something that we've been doing within the community of practice on social economic data over the past few years. Um, we are committed to making data interoperable in, in order to make data more actionable. Um, socioeconomic data uh, generally uh, is not really that, uh, that interoperable. Why? Because it's messy. Uh, it's a mixture of structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data. There are no, uh, there are no standards um, across the board, uh, which makes uh, the combination of data and joining data and comparing data across time and space uh, difficult. And we, and for us, it, it, we think it's really important to, uh, to, make, that, uh, to make that happen. Uh, so the, there is two, two elements here. One is standardization, uh, standardization of survey questions where it makes sense. Um, so this is not about um, creating a blueprint for which all surveys have to uh, uh, have to uh, which have to meet, but there are some kind of, some questions which are very commonly used across many surveys, and uh, uh, finding some way of standardizing those questions um, uh, may, can make uh, can make a lot of sense for intercomparability. Um, harmonization is about um, the kind of approaches in order to make uh, data comparable across time and space. Now, right now, with the current um, COVID-19 crisis um, and in its wake, uh, an impending food crisis, um, it's, re it's really important to, to be able to have that kind of actionable in, information fast. And uh, for that, we've gotten a very nice panel uh, today. Um, next slide, please. Um, with Mark van Dijk, um, who is with ILRI and uh, is leading a lot of the work on ROMIS, uh, which is a, um, uh, an effort um, at data standardization and harmonization, which has been uh, going on for quite a while. Mark also leads uh, the working group on data harmonization and standardization within the community of practice. We have uh, Elizabeth Bryan, uh, who is with IFPRI uh, and who's uh, currently involved in uh, some uh, COVID-19 uh, impact assessments, looking especially at the gen uh, gender issues. Uh, Louis Raymondin from from SIAT, um, based in Vietnam, um, 
is involved in the Inspire Grant winning uh, project on free uh, internet in the market of Hanoi, uh, uh, where um, uh, the free access is linked to a answering a few questions. And uh, over the past uh, few months, um, they have been asking COVID-19 related questions. Um, uh, Amjad Babu uh, of CIMIT, based in Bangladesh, uh, is, uh, is currently involved in, in a bunch of work related to um, uh, the, va uh, the va value, cha uh, value chains and the impact of COVID-19 on them. Uh, and uh, Anton, is, uh, uh, who's also with uh, SIAT, um, is, uh, is involved in uh, a series of um, uh, phone surveys related to COVID-19 uh, based on the Q5 uh, principle. Um, so, uh, without further uh, further ado, uh, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, invite our, uh, our our panelists uh, to to talk. Um, so, uh, as Matt already said, they will give a brief introduction. We will have some clarifying Q and A. Um, and then uh, the discussion. In the discussion, uh, there is two big main questions which we have um, identified pr prior to the webinar. Um, one is what level of harmonization and standardization uh, makes sense uh, in the current situation? Uh, and the second question is, um, can we put out some, recommend uh, some recommended protocol for doing this type of impact Phone, uh, phone surveys. The focus of today's webinar is on the con is on the content uh, and uh, as the the kind of questions you were asking. The amount of information we're collecting in uh, in this, uh, we're not going to to talk about um, the technical details related to phone uh, to phones uh, for, uh, to phone surveys. Nor are we going to be talking about the ethical issues. Um, we intend to organize additional webinars on those uh, on those issues in the very near future. So without further ado, I hand over uh, uh, this to uh, the panelists. Okay. Hello, everybody. I will uh, talk about ROMIS, the Rural Household Multiple Indicator Survey mini version of ROMIS, mini ROMIS called, and how we apply these tools uh, within the current COVID-19 uh, settings. So my name is Mark van Wijk, uh, and I should also mention my uh, long-term collaborator, Jim Hammond, who has been really the driving force behind the mini ROMIS version. Um, so describing the ROMIS effort, um, in this effort, we try to systematize and harmonize data collection an indicator quantification for surveys that try to characterize farm households. We build up libraries of uh, survey and analysis codes. Um, in this effort, we process data as rapidly as possible and perform key visualizations. We perform data quality control and also control as much as possible survey implementations. Um, in the ROMIS uh, survey approach, we have sort of a semi-flexible uh, approach uh, where we have what we could say the core uh, ROMIS version that, uh, that contain modules that are always collected in every application of the ROMIS survey around the same are always collected in every application of the ROMIS survey around decision making, gender, a uh, certain level of metadata information on on-farm activities, foods, uh, food security, dietary diversity, and property dynamics. And this core version in all applications combine with optional modules uh, that make the survey fit for purpose for specific projects and for specific uh, research interests. And this we do in a very systematized way. So now, by now we have built up a whole library of these optional modules which we can basically use now in a plug and play uh, type of way. 
And again, there's much more detail around decision making that is captured in the in the core value, in the core modules. Uh, On-farm activities, if we want to have more detailed information around management, uh, if we want to have more de detailed information about nutrition, poverty dynamics, gender, uh, the environment, uh, all of these modules are now available and we've applied them already in different uh, project settings and with different partners. Uh, so, so what you could call the semi-flexible uh, approach, combination of a core setup of the tool in combination with optional modules we've now applied in, in uh, many different settings many different farming systems with many different projects uh, since 2015 when we started this effort uh, resulting in a harmonized database of now containing more than 32,000 interviews in 30, uh, 33 countries yeah? and a wide range of research organizations major donors and NGOs have used the tool under the sign up um, we have a lot of uh, locally focused studies that go in depth into uh, specific agricultural systems. But of course, the, the key aim of this whole effort was to uh, do comparison, comparison studies across systems, across uh, projects. Then uh, in recent uh, times, we have published several of those studies. For example, this is an example uh, focusing on food security and nutrition. Another recent paper of last year is, is focusing really on gendered information, uh, with, uh, inequality and equality, and how they play out in different systems and over uh, different activities. And a key publication we recently uh, that recently came out uh, really makes available a first batch of data from the Roma's effort. Um, so we we made available on Dataverse uh, the first database of the of household data in combination with all the analysis and indicator quantification uh, software, yeah, all is publicly available. And as you can see in all of these, these papers, we have a lot, a lot of co-authors, yeah, we really want to work in a uh, jointly collaborative fashion, so all publications that we bring out based on Roma's data, we really involve also the local experts and have been instrumental in collecting the data. And so that is really a joint effort. Um, so in the new COVID world, Romus, despite being focused and targeted, is still too long for phone-based interviews. Yeah, if we go through the phone-based methodology, yeah, normally Romus takes about 45 minutes per interview. And we therefore developed a mini Romus, an abbreviated version that still captures key indicators on resources, production, income, dietary diversity, and food security, but takes much less time per interview. And this one was recently applied by ITA in Nigeria, interviewing more than 1,200 households. Yeah. And in that mini Romus, we also took on board results of earlier analysis of uh, what, what type of information we can ask through mobile phone application of the tool. So key modification of the mini Romus compared to the overall Romus, and there was always, of course, a difficult uh, set of decisions to make, is that we have a reduced number of food security and poverty indicators. We reduced the detail of the gender information that we collect, and we no longer do greenhouse gas emission quantification, so simplifying a little bit the management information that we collect. And this mini Romus uh, module or uh, tool can easily be expanded with a COVID assessment module. We have already a first draft of this module, but this one we would like to uh, align as much as possible with other ongoing initiatives. And hopefully in the discussion after this presentation, we can go in a little bit more depth there how we can achieve. Key characteristics of the mini Romus COVID tool is that the data collected will seamlessly link up with the mother Romus database. Yeah, all questions, data, labels, units, etc., are the same as in the uh, generic um, application of the overall Romus uh, survey. But not, not only with the Romus database, but also we already in earlier work collected a lot of other databases of household characterization data, for example, the World Bank House Mesaisa data, and, and from projects like N2 Africa and Simlesa and Afrin. And also there we have a common uh, library of, of labels, data labels, data variables, etc. So it seamlessly communicates with that database as well. So the overall database on which we can build in these uh, mini Romans type of application already contains information of more than 60,000 households. So that's a large on which we can build. And this all this combination of data and reuse of data will allow us to assess potential sampling biases, 
Yeah? If we only uh, interview farmers with cell phones, that's the possible bias that can enter, of course, in the sampling. Assess the reliability of phone-based uh, collected information compared to in-person interviews and scale up our results uh, and derive overall patterns of likely COVID impacts using existing data. Um, some, some information regarding plans are discussed, applications in the pipeline, you could say. Applications that are prepared and soon to be executed and already decided upon are two applications in Vietnam. One in which we revisit households interviewed one year ago. So that will allow us again to, uh, to assess the quality of the information uh, we're collecting with uh, phone-based interviews. In Cambodia, also here we will revisit uh, households. And in Uganda. And there's a whole series of applications that are currently being discussed. And there's still a big question mark, of course, whether they apply, yes or no. So we're talking about uh, possible applications together with SEAT in Kenya, uh, in East Africa with the One Acre Fund, with IFDC in Mozambique and with the livestock CFB and their focus country applications. And then we're talking about Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia. Uh, furthermore, maybe interesting is that the mini roms is currently being integrated into the Klimop platform, which is a biodiversity's crowdsourcing platform, which uh, is another potential way to scale out uh, the mini roms applications and the integration with the overall Romus database. Yeah, that's what I wanted to tell in this uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear audience of the webinar, in my talk, I would like to quickly navigate you all through the cascading impacts of COVID-19 along agriculture value chains, especially in a South Asian or Bangladesh context. The ongoing pandemic is creating unprecedented crisis in food systems of developing countries and may cause long-term implications, in addition to severe short-term repercussions. To avoid major negative outcomes, the impacts along the value chain need to be regularly monitored to assist in devising policy interventions aiming to offset the impacts. The phone surveys can take a crucial role in this monitoring effort. Before talking about the surveys, let me give you a snapshot of the impact cascades of COVID-19 and associated measures to contain the spread, which included stay-at-home orders, movement and transport restrictions, and social distancing measures to highlight the importance of harmonizing surveys. This is no way comprehensive, as understanding of the complexity of the agriculture implications of the pandemic is only evolving. The COVID-19 disease and containment measures in Bangladesh led to labor shortages, constraint, logistics of seeds, fertilizers, chemicals, and machinery parts. The availability of agriculture services for operations like seeding, harvesting, threshing, etc., are also affected given the reduced mobility of machines and labor with cost implications. The increase in cost of cultivation along with reduced flow of remittance to rural areas and temporary measures like diverting productive capital for consumption purposes affects capital availability for the next crop season. When combined with the delays in harvesting of 2019-20 winter crops, reduced seed and input availability, labor shortages, and limited availability of credit can delay planting of monsoon crops that can have a knockdown impact on the following winter crops. All these conditions are likely to cause production declines. Nevertheless, the major impact of COVID-19 is, is expressed through the decline in defective demand of the consumers especially of income elastic goods like poultry products, milk, vegetables, fish, meat, etc., reflecting the reduction in consumers' real income. This will also be reflected in purchase decisions of feed and grain mills, as well as wholesale and retail players. The decline in market demand can lead to low farm rate prices when coupled with logistic constraints, production price and sale decline can lead to substantial reduction in farm income and that will have a feedback effects to cash flows and liquidity along the supply chain. The impact will be heavier for small and medium enterprises in the supply chain. Given the complex impacts of COVID-19 along the value chain, regular collection of data on various indicators of value chain health is important. CIMIT is rolling out a set of surveys in Bangladesh aiming at input dealers, machinery service providers, and feed companies. Similar surveys of CIMIT are in pipeline in Nepal also. First, let me give you the key details of the input dealer survey. 
the telephone interviews are carried out with randomly selected input dealers from an existing list of fertilizers, chemicals, seed and machinery part dealers of 20 districts in Bangladesh. The survey starts with a description of the survey aims and consent process and collect minimum details of the respondents like age, location, and gender. We designed most of the questions on related to COVID-19 driven disruption of logistics, change in working hours, access to banking services, change in business volumes as multiple choice questions to make it easier for the respondents. If the response is not included in the choices provided, it is separately captured. The specific questions on availability and prices of pest and weed control products before and after COVID-19 related restrictive measures are included to understand the pandemic's impacts on pest management. Baseline surveys is expected to be 20 to 30 minutes long with follow-up shorter surveys of 10 to 15 minutes after two weeks. A consent question to conduct for a follow-up survey is also included. In case of missionary service providers, like tractors, seed drills, combined harvesters, reapers, irrigation farms, etc. Similar sampling procedure is followed for the survey, but contact list is available only for 15 districts. It could be possible that non-availability of such databases may delay the survey efforts in many developing countries. After receiving consent, multiple choice questions on supply disruption of fuel, lubricants, spare parts of machinery, access to mechanics, transport constraints, communication with clients, access to drivers, and missionary operators are posed. Questions related to COVID-19 safety measures taken for missionary operations is also included. The baseline survey also tries to capture service charges before and after COVID-19 spread and restrictive measures to understand the price volatility. Follow-up surveys are, are planned after two weeks. All surveys are done using ODK open source platform. The enumerators are trained virtually. A third survey covers 15 feed companies that produce more than 70% of the poultry and aquaculture feed. During the call, after the consent process, multiple choice questions on factory operation, closure, availability of male and female laborers, wage rates before and after COVID-19 spread and restrictive measures, willingness of managers, staff and laborers to work in factory, adoption of COVID safe operation procedures, availability and prices of inputs for feed production, maize, brand, maize, rice bran, mustard oil, cake, soy meal, fish meal, feed binder, etc., and production and prices of different kinds of fish and poultry feeds are collected. After the baseline survey of 30 to 40 minutes, follow-up shorter surveys of 10 to 15 minutes are planned after four weeks. For all surveys, confidentiality of information is assured and a feedback is promised. Many of the challenges described by earlier presenters is also applicable for the described CIMIT surveys. We need to highlight some of the specific constraints. Despite our efforts, we are unable to cover all actors of the value chain, even for our focal commodities like maize and wheat. Cooperation with other CGR and non-CGR institutions are essential in this regard. A limited number of questions that can be included in 20 to 30 minutes long survey also limit the amount of information that can be collected. A possible way is to develop multi-call survey method. There is a need to further explore its potential. Virtual hiring and training of enumerators in the use of survey software is difficult and may limit sample size. We are using enumerators who are already skilled in the use of ODK platform, but working on ways to do effective virtual training on survey software is important in telephone survey deployment. Building and maintaining database of phone numbers of actors along the value chain is important for successful surveys. More energy, budget, and time needs to be allocated for such exercises. Another issue is that COVID-19 impact may amplify impacts of other challenges. So harmonization with other surveys is also a requirement. For example, a survey of fall army worm impacts now need to include questions on COVID-19 impact on availability of labor, chemicals, and biological forest control. Another major difference is the need of immediate publication of data and generation of policy recommendations. A data and policy dashboard is expected to address this challenge in Bangladesh. Development of data briefs and policy notes is also possible options. A resilient food system against COVID-19 is one that has resilient supply chains, COVID safe logistics, extended social safety nets, adequate credit facilities, innovative labor management tools, larger scale farm mechanization, COVID safe operation protocols, digital extension services, circular nutrient supplies, 
enhanced storage facilities, innovative market mechanisms, and effective international trade management policies and institutions. The harmonization of surveys is a first and key step towards building such a resilient system. Thanks a lot for listening to the talk. I am open to questions at the end of the webinar. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Bryan. I'm a senior scientist in the Environment and Production Technology Division at IFPRI, and I'm delighted to join you all virtually today from my basement to talk about some new research we're planning related to the gendered impacts of COVID-19. And we'll be using data that we're collecting through phone surveys in several countries. First, I wanna give some motivation for why we're doing this research. As previous research shows, men and women are differentially affected by shocks and stressors, and they have different capacities to respond. We suspect that it will be no different with the current COVID-19 crisis. It's important for policymakers and other decision makers to understand these differences so that they can better target their programs to support the specific needs of men and women. This particular research activity emerged out of a project funded by USAID, which is called the Gender, Climate Change, and Nutrition Integration Initiative, or GCAN. And we were asked by USAID um, to provide some evidence of the gendered impacts of the crisis to further assist them in their funding and programming decisions as they respond to the crisis. This same survey is also being carried out in India with funding from BMZ Germany. In this case, our partner organization, SEWA, which is a grassroots women's organization, was interested to better understand the impacts of the crisis on its own members. As I mentioned, there's ongoing research that shows that men and women are differentially affected by climate shocks and stressors. And this framework shown here was developed for the GCAN project, and it illustrates how climate shocks and stressors on men and women are filtered through several key elements. These include an individual's exposure to the shock or stressor, their resilience capacities, their bargaining power or ability to influence decisions within the household or the community or other spaces, and the responses that are taken to cope with, reduce risks, or adapt to shocks and stressors. So while originally the GCAN project focused on examining the differential impacts of climate shocks and stressors, the same thinking can be applied to virtually any type of shock that rural farm households face. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered both health and economic shocks. Uh, the well-being outcomes of men and women depend largely on their resilience capacities to absorb the impact of these shocks and the immediate coping responses that these households adopt. We imagine that there are several impact pathways um, that are going to be important to track during the COVID-19 crisis. As a result of these health and economic shocks due to COVID-19, there are several possible gendered outcomes, and these include a loss of control over income by women, and this could be either due to a loss of women's sources of income or because men may take over greater control over household spending decisions as income declines. There may also be differences in asset dynamics if assets are sold as a coping response. So it's important to track whose assets are being sold or whose savings are being depleted as a result of the crisis. There may also be important shifts in labor allocation. For example, women may go in search of work if their husbands lose their jobs. And there may be an increase in the care burden of women, either due to having children at home from school or because they're caring for sick household members. Another impact could be related to differences in mobility of men and women under lockdown conditions. So it's important to track who goes out for essential activities such as fetching water or fuel wood or obtaining food for the household as these decisions have important implications for different family members' risk of exposure to the disease. Different household members uh, also may experience food insecurity differently or have different changes in dietary diversity. And finally, the increased stress 
brought on by the crisis and having all the family members confined to the home may increase the incidence of conflict or intimate partner violence. So to try and dig into some of these pathways and impacts that we think are possible, we developed a questionnaire that aims to collect data on all these different impact pathways. And we also tried to ask about direct impacts of the crisis, although I should point out that this first question here, has anyone in the household been sick in the last seven days, is not intended to directly measure the incidence of COVID-19 cases in any way. Um, we use this more to look at the sort of care burden impacts. However, the second question directly relates to COVID-19 because um, whether we ask whether the household has lost any income due to the crisis. And we also ask questions throughout the survey about the WASH environment as a measure of resilience capacity. We ask about the loss of control over income as a measure of bargaining power. We ask about asset sales, use of savings, borrowing behavior, and the receipt of direct transfers from government or other sources as coping measures. We also look at changes in labor allocation and the increase in care burden as coping measures. We ask about mobility um, needed to buy food or seek medical care, fetch water or fuel wood. And we ask about changes in food insecurity and dietary diversity. And these uh, are also reflective of both coping measures and uh, differential outcomes of men and women potentially. And we finally, we ask about conflict, specifically to what extent the main male and female decision makers are able to work together to solve problems and whether women are fear fearful of their partner. And so these are direct outcomes of having a more stressful situation at home. We specifically don't ask about intimate partner violence because of the sensitivity of this issue and the, the difficulty of collecting this information over the phone. To collect these data, we are drawing on previous face-to-face -face surveys in selected countries where phone numbers were collected as part of the survey. These include USAID, Feed the Future Countries, Nepal, Nigeria, Senegal, and possibly also Ghana. And the same survey will also be implemented with members of our partner organization, SEWA, in India, and that work will be funded by BMZ. The way the survey will be implemented depends on the country. So in Nepal, Senegal, and India, we're working with previous IFPRI partners to collect the data. And in Nigeria and Ghana, we plan to use a survey company that has a virtual call center in the country. We chose to go with previously surveyed households rather than randomly generated numbers because we have a relationship with these households and we think that the response rate will therefore be higher. We expect the questionnaire to take around 20 to 30 minutes to complete and the survey will be done over five or six rounds over a six month period, which with each of the rounds lasting less than two weeks. Uh, the sample will be half women and half men, so from the original survey, we'll take 50% of the main female decision maker, and then the other half will take the main male decision maker, and then we'll follow the same respondent through all of the survey rounds. And the survey will be programmed in Survey CTO or the proprietary software of the survey company we're using, um, but will mostly be standard across all of the countries that I mentioned. We anticipate that there will be several potential challenges with these phone surveys. One is that many of the respondents from the original sample do not have phones, so in this case we might miss the most vulnerable households from our sample. Most of the households have only one phone, and that is likely controlled by the male head of household, so we anticipate that we may have more difficulty reaching female respondents. Some of the questions, namely those related to household conflict, are also very sensitive. And we expect that some of the women respondents may have difficulty taking the call in private. For example, we have some reports from India that some of the women have to take calls on speakerphone with other household members or their spouse present. And in these cases, we would not ask the sensitive questions. Another challenge is that although we have rich data for the sample of households in each country, we may not get consent from the respondent to link the current phone survey responses with their previous data, although we will ask them for their consent. 
Another issue is that because we are asking sensitive questions, uh, we will need to refer the women to the appropriate services, but we don't know whether these services will be functioning adequately at this time. So we have thought of some other ways to manage questions and concerns that arise from the phone survey, such as potentially having an IFPRI staff person screen these and help direct them to the appropriate places. We may also face challenges in getting the local IRB approval or government approval to conduct the phone survey if these operations are temporarily shut down. Finally, another limitation is that the survey is designed to pick up only short to medium term impacts of COVID-19, um, given the time frame that we have for this activity, but there may be other longer term effects that we're not able to pick up. So even with these uh, limitations, we will do our best to try to assess the differences um, in the ways that men and women experience the challenges related to COVID-19 and to analyze these results to provide some useful insights for our donors, for policymakers, and other interested people. Um, and with that, I'll close and I'm happy to take your questions during the Q&A. Thanks very much for listening. Good afternoon. My name is Anton Eitzinger. I am a scientist at the Alliance Biodiversity International and CEAP. I will talk about the 5Q approach and how we use it for COVID-related research. The 5Q approach was developed by CEAP and it has been applied in several agriculture development projects during recent years. 5Q incorporates feedback to improve understanding of what is happening on the ground. In Tanzania, for example, we used 5Q to understand farmers' knowledge, attitudes, and skills on climate smart agriculture practices. In Rwanda, we have used it to follow up with farmers after trainings on climate services. And in Uganda, we asked farmers about the step by implementation of coffee management practices. The basic principle of 5Q is keep it smart and simple. Don't overwhelm farmers with long service but collect your data through recurring rounds of service and constantly build up your data. Include different stakeholders and use digital tools. We had very good experience in data collection using interactive voice response calls, IVR calls, and also using survey interviews and mobile apps for data collection. So how can 5Q being applied to your research? 5Q is complementary to your data collection strategies, but needs to build up on your theory of change or research question. In development projects, it cannot replace your baseline service, impact assessment, or ME activities, but it improves learning during implementation and provides near real-time feedback for decision making. In research projects, it's a cost-effective way of data collection and can even start in the pre-project or proposal phase it can also be used after your project is already finished. The 5Q approach follows these main process steps. First, and based on your theory of change and research question, the team develops simple sets or modules of more or less five questions and constructs a question logic tree. The trees are very important to keep your data collection efficient, since the farmer moves through the branches and will always get the right question. Before starting the data collection, you have to define groups and typologies and plan how often you will repeat the surveys. Finally, select the digital tools that best fits to your context and define your sampling and segmentation strategy. Once you have everything prepared, operating the calls and surveys is easy and fast. With IVR calls, you can get results within a few hours and you can start analyzing the data or include them on your data dashboards. On the final slide, I will provide a short overview how we use 5Q for COVID-related research over the next weeks and months. We have started a near real-time monitoring of disruptions from COVID on vulnerable groups and the functioning of food systems. Until now, we worked on the question library for COVID and designed modules for 5Q surveys. We will start the first pilot in Rwanda with five to 10,000 farmers that have been participating in the climate service project. 
We will also follow up with farmers who participated on climate service roundtables in Colombia and Honduras. Further, in Pakistan, with a new project designing climate smart villages, we will run several rounds of service with farmers and other value chain actors in all agricultural districts of Pakistan. In Kenya, we will work with partners of ongoing research pro projects, like for example, with consumers from Nairobi food market. And in the Philippines, we have presented a proposal for monitoring market access and food supply in climate smart villages. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I will try to, to be to be quick and hide this somewhere. Okay. This uh, this project is to uh, show uh, informal food flow through free Wi-Fi uh, in Vietnam in Hanoi. Um, this project is an uh, Inspired Challenge winner in 2018 and uh, then a 2019 uh, Scale Up Grant winner also in the Big Data Platform uh, Inspired Challenge. Uh, it's in collaboration with the uh, GSO, the General Statistic Office of Vietnam. Um, and uh, Basically, we offer free Wi-Fi in a series of markets in Hanoi to get more information from our user in exchange. So, as I just said, uh, our study area is uh, in Hanoi. Uh, we've got uh, two urban markets, two peri-urban markets, and one uh, wholesale market. Um, and uh, in each of those markets, we installed a series of access points, uh, about five per market access points. And with each of those access points, we uh, collect data. So there's a first layer of analysis. It's a layer one, we call it. It's a device level. And in near real time or in real time, we scan all the devices that are in the, in the market. So these data are aggregated in report. Uh, every two minutes, and we download those data every every two minutes. So every two minutes, we can know uh, how many phones are in the market, uh, how long stay those phones stayed in the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there, there's the layer two. Uh, layer two is basically a survey software that asks one question to each uh, user every time they try to connect to the internet. So Every time you go online, you see one question, you, you answer, and then you can continue and you have internet. A little bit in the same way than the, the 5Q that Anton presented, uh, we, we ask uh, one single question, but the, the next question uh, is based on the, on the previous answer. So we build the survey as we go along with, uh, with the users. And finally, there's layer three. Uh, which is a survey done uh, with pen and paper with the with the sellers and and in in each market that we cannot do for the moment because of the of the lockdown in the city. Uh, so the system is operational since the twenty seventh of July two thousand nineteen. Uh, with layer one, since, since then we have collected already almost one hundred and seventy million phone occurrences, so uh, a phone that we've seen at a given time at a given access point. Uh, and with layer two, we provided about 130,000 internet sessions to about 7,000 users. So more or less what, 19, between 19 and 18 questions, I guess, per user. Um, and something that's because we can monitor the market uh, every every two minutes and know how many people are in the market every two minutes. One thing that we quickly saw is that right after Tet um, and very important uh, holidays in in Vietnam, right after Tet, uh, the school didn't reopen because of the first cases of COVID in in the country, and we saw a 27 person drop in frequentation in, in the market. The, there was no lockdown or whatever, but in general, maybe because people were afraid or something, we don't know yet exactly why, but 
uh, there were many few less people in the in the market about 27 less we can see also if we look at around the 9 of march uh, the, there is an increase of cases in the in the country the blue line there is an increase of, of covid cases in the country and people rush to the market those two peak in the data is uh, people rushing to the market to buy commodities and to buy food uh, in in case of a of a lockdown of the city, and around the 30th of March, we can see another peak, smaller peak, but it's right up, right before the lockdown of the city. People again rush to the market and buy uh, food and commodities. After that, we can see that the number of people even decreased more, and it's during the the lockdown of the of the city. We've looked a little bit more into into detail uh, in. Uh, this loss of, of users and we classified our, our user by passerby passerby are people that are going uh, within a, a an interval of three months are going to the market uh, less than one time per week then we've got our frequent user uh, that goes between uh, one and three times per week to the market and then the very frequent users that are going uh, between uh, four and seven times per week. What we've seen is that the biggest drop of, of users is indeed in the very frequent users. We've seen a 38% drop. Some of those users became frequent users, so they're still going to the market. Um, but some of those very frequent users also totally disappeared and we never seen them again uh, in, the, in the market since, since then. Uh, we can see in general that all the categories lost um, lost uh, actors, uh, so people are going less frequently to the market, and we also see that uh, there's a, a drop in the new phones that we are seeing. So every day we see new phones, but suddenly we saw a drop of 20% of, of phones that we are not seeing anymore. Uh, in terms of duration, uh, so people spend more or less the same time in the market. There's 56 percent of the people didn't change their habit in terms of duration, so they stay in the market the same duration. 26 of the people stay shorter visits, and 17 percent of the people stay longer visits. So this this is the kind of data that we have with with layer one, and we just wanted to check with the users if uh if they had uh, if they they agree with our analysis that people are going less to the market uh, so we ask the consumers since the coronavirus outbreak do you go less than usual to the market uh, i did not change my habit so i go more often to the market we also ask this to the people go, uh, about the, the supermarket and and we can see that a large majority of people a consumer says they go uh, less than usual to the, to the market and then to the sellers we just ask do you notice a change in the amount of goods sold due to the corona epidemic epidemic and we can see again a very strong uh, reduction of the of the amount of goods sold so it's two very basic questions but for the moment we just use the system um, to, to check that what we are observing in with the layer one uh, correspond to something that uh, our, our users agree with. Uh, but in the future, we, we are uh, planning to, to ask uh, more questions related to this or maybe more precious questions. And just a, a little check that we have the full IRB clearance for this, uh, for this uh, project because uh, we use very sensitive data and uh, we can know basically when a phone was here or not we are everything is anonymized in our database and of course the users give their full consent when they go when they connect to the internet for us to use the information etc et and basically that's it um i think we can continue with with the webinar now thank you
Okay, um, now it's time for the Q&A. Um, Matt, are there any questions from uh, that came in through the chat? That we yeah, so a few of the questions that have come up, I might put, uh, uh, I'll read them here, is that people are wondering about uh, different ontologies that were used to collect the data. And um, other people were also wondering what exactly the CG is and why is it important uh, to have a kind of harmonization across the board? There were two questions that have come through. Um, Mark? You want to pick up the first one? You should be unmuted, Mark. Yeah. Now it should work, no? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Um, so within the Romus effort, we don't have a formal ontology. Of course, we have everything documented and described and, uh, and mapped out. Um, but that is still that is still work in progress. So there's also the activity ontology activity within the uh, community of practice on socioeconomic data, and we work together with them indeed to develop a much more formal ontology uh, to describe the survey approach and the questions we have included in our system. That's still a work in progress. Okay, so the second the second question was related to what the CGIAR is um, and uh, the role of what the role is of uh, data harmonization CGIAR. Um, for those who do not know, the CGIAR is a consortium of uh, 12 uh, international agricultural research centers and alliances um, of, uh, of, cent of centers, um, in total 15 centers, uh, three of which, uh, there's uh, a couple of which are uh, uh, in, uh, in alliances, um, and working on the main food crops in low and middle income uh, middle income countries um, as well as livestock and uh, and fish um, uh, that is what the cgiar is uh, developing new technologies and uh, doing research on uh, everything related to the agro food systems of the main of the main food uh the the main uh, food uh, uh commodities uh for uh for the resource poor in low and middle income countries um that basically is what what the cgiar is uh within uh, the cgiar um the um there is a lot of data that is being uh, being collected um um, it's been estimated that for, uh, in terms of socioeconomic surveys, there is about a quarter million uh, households surveyed each year across the CGIAR in the different uh, in the different centers, different projects, etc. Although all that data is not uh, not interoperable uh, because um, they're very very often based on idiosyncratic uh, des uh, design. Uh, at best, um, it is comparable within uh, within uh, a project. Um, that means that there is a lot of data out there, um, which is very difficult to reuse, uh, even if there is a value in reusing that data. And that's where the uh, the notion of uh, harmonization and standardization come uh, comes into play in order to make the data more more uh, more actionable. Uh, I hope that answers uh, answers the question. Matt, were there other questions? 
Yeah, so another one has come through a bit about, it said, quite a lot of you are covering a lot of different topics in uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, a lot more than um, they would have expected based on the time taken to do face-to-face -face surveys. So approximately how many actual multiple choice or short answer questions on top of the initial getting consent and explaining the research um, does it actually translate to? So I think it's basically looking to say how big are these surveys in actual fact. Who wants to go first? Elizabeth? Uh, you need to unmute. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, yes, we realize that um, our survey is a little bit ambitious probably in terms of the number of topics that we hope to cover during the phone survey. And we are aiming to keep it within a 20 minute time period, but we are still in the process of pre-testing it. So we'll know exactly how long it should take, including the informed consent. And then we can make some adjustments if needed. Um, we could potentially split it across a couple of phone calls to be able to cover more. But I think if we wanna keep it within the 20 minutes, within the two week time frame to get through the entire sample, then we will probably need to make a few additional cuts. But we try to have um, all sort of coded responses for each of the questions. I think there are only two questions in the entire survey that are open-ended and we think would only require sort of quick um, responses from the respondents. So we're hoping that we should be able to keep it within a, a limited window. Um, I wanted to make another comment on, on the harmonization across CGR. Although I think a lot of our surveys are done at a sort of a project level and there's not a lot of standardization, we do also put together some tools, uh, survey tools on gender related work. So one example would be the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, which has been a applied quite broadly, not just within some projects, but across the CGR centers and other projects as well outside the CG system. So, and there are different versions of that that are under development and they have sort of standard modules that can be used and then standard, you know, static coding um, that is provided so that they're all run the same way. And there is an online training that is being prepared for people who want to be able to use and apply this tool. And so some of the thinking that we use for this particular phone survey comes from the way, although they're not standard questions, because we had to develop a new set of questions that look specifically at the, what we consider to be potential COVID-19 impacts um, on men and women. So that's um, you know, not part of this way a tool, but there are standard tools that exist to look at gender impacts of, of different um, shocks and stressors or different projects uh, and can be used in different ways. Oh, good point, good point, Elizabeth. This is definitely the way it is a very good example of a standardized module that is being used across uh, across many, many projects and uh, across many centers uh, within the CBIAR. Uh, Mark, do you like, would you like to add something? Um, yes, for us, it's all still testing as well. Um, I think we're sort of around the the, the 100 questions uh, type of benchmark. That's that's roughly the the length, and that again translates into a survey length of 15 to 20 uh, 20 minutes, and that's indeed uh, the maximum you can uh, you can handle the, during a phone interview. Amjad, have you done any testing of the the phone surveys with agro dealers? Please unmute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So uh, we have 17 questions with, with uh, around six of them or seven of them are multiple choice questions. And it's 
it takes around 30 minutes because all questions are not applicable to all the dealerships some of the for example if we are uh, surveying input dealers some of the questions may not be applicable to some sections so overall they are answering around 12 13 questions and uh, it is taking around 20 to 30 minutes so that is going on well but still uh, uh, as i told in my presentation we are uh, we if we are unable to take some information uh, in the first instance we are looking for the follow up surveys where you, we are including some additional questions and dropping some of the previous questions. So it's a dynamic thing. So it, we can include uh, mul multiple aspects of it, even if there is a shorter time period to, to ask uh, the questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Amjad. Um, Anton, uh, your approach is based on being really short, right? Yeah. So I hope everybody can hear me well. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's very important that when we talk about phone interviews and there are different ways of doing phone interviews. So like doing a call through a call center or in the case what we did, we used a lot this um, interactive voice response calls and it's really important uh, the way how you implement them. So we, we heard of, like it's about numbers of questions, <laughs> I guess. And so what we do is, so we, we, we do the same start, we develop our modules and questions we want to ask. So in this case now for the current uh, study, we are also between 20 and 30 questions that we would like to get response from farmers, but we, we split them in different packages and different call packages. So a farmer would in one call would not get, would get low, less than 10 questions like, so ideally that's what our approach is about five questions or five levels of questions because it's a question tree. So it goes depending on, on what type of response he provides, like yes, no, different branch. And it's also very important um, if you do choices in questions, just reduce them. Uh, do not use the nine numbers of your dial bed, use maybe up to maximum five or four because a farmer would not uh, remember when you tell him nine options, uh, the first one. So it's, it's really about planning implementation and, and, and also testing it. It's, it's very important that the time of day when you call the farmer, it's very important to send him pre-information a few days before, like a voice message or a text message or whatever. So it really, it really has a great impact on your response rate. So we, we, we tested that on our first projects in Tanzania and Uganda. It can be between 20 and 60% of your response rate based on how you design your your call. So it's very important. I think it's also should be part of our efforts to, to harmonize amongst the CG centers how we do this type of phone interviews because there's a lot learning and I think all of us have done some of this learning already. So if you can share this, the ways how we implement them can really increase uh, our response rate. And obviously this is different in different cultures and countries. So there's always a, a way how we need to discuss the specific context. Um, there was a bit of a follow-up follow -up question on that one. It's uh, thinking about uh, farmers' schedules and different things. Uh, is there a specific time frame during the day that may fit, fit better with farmers to do these type of surveys? So I could just uh, talk about our experiences we had in Tanzania and Uganda. So we got advice from, our, from local experts, call farmers early in the morning. And it turned out that it was the wrong decision <laughs> because we then asked farmers, when do you prefer to call you? And they said all in the afternoon, but it really depends on the country. And, and this is one question you need to ask some of your farmers in, 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 the, in the phase where you are preparing your calls. So for, for example, in Uganda, it was after 3 p.m. So we called them in the time window between 3 and 6 p.m. And yeah. So it's, it depends, but it's normally it's, it's, it's in the evening, I would say. And um, another one about the phone interviews are, are these person-to-person -person interviews or automated systems? Um, and how can you avoid errors, especially on person-to-person uh, -person interviews over all of the centers?
Mm -hmm. I can go for the interactive voice response calls. <laughs> uh, yes, the, obviously that's that's one of the problems you have because actually you are calling a phone number, so it should be anonymized, and and so you need to ask um, some demographic questions to know what's the person that's on the other side. And obviously there's there's a there can be a bias, and I will say that's why it, it's difficult sometimes for for gender questions or for, like for gender service because. It's really important to know if it's the man or the, or the woman, or, or sometimes you want to have both of them, so you need to call separately. But you, you're not. So that's that's some some difficulties with the interactive voice response calls. And I don't know if anybody else would like to respond for the interviews because we didn't do uh, calls and the interviews in our projects. Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, we're planning to use um, enumerators calling the respondents over the phone, so we're not using any automated, um, any automated software. Um, the the survey itself will be coded already in Survey CTO, and the enumerators will be trained. And we have some of the countries where there will be several different languages that it will have to be implemented in, so it'll have to be translated ahead of time and uh, the enumerators will have to be trained on, on how to ask the questions and trained on the sensitivity issues, especially with talking to women about conflict in the household and in how to get proper consent. And we're also, given that there is this issue of some women not being able to answer in private, we have a way of asking whether they are on speakerphone and if they're on speakerphone, then we will skip those questions and only ask the other questions. So we are trying to come up with some ways of dealing with some of the sensitive issues. And obviously the enumerator teams will have to be trained on how to implement the survey so that we can avoid any potential problems. Um, and another question is about where data will be stored um, and how quickly and easily accessible this data is yeah. is that directed at me or or well, it's a, it was in general to okay to all yeah i can i i can start i can give a, a first answer to that um uh the way that date the the data the socioeconomic data in general uh, within the cgiar is stored it depends from center to center and even within centers from project to project. Um, uh, there are some efforts uh, underway in different parts of the CGIAR uh, to, um, uh, to work towards uh, some good, uh, some best practices in terms of uh, responsible data management. Um, uh, because the, the, the issue is um, you are dealing with human subjects research data, which means that the data as is cannot just be put out there in, in open access for, for anyone, uh, anyone to use. Uh, uh, it, it needs to be cur uh, curated to generate um, data sets that, uh, 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 that are sufficiently anonymized um, uh, for which uh, if the, it contains sensitive, uh, sensitive inform, uh, information um, that uh, uh, it's sufficiently aggregated uh, so that it's not only individuals that, uh, that are protected, but perhaps also, uh, also commu uh, communities. And so, uh, you know, especially if, uh, in the case of the, the gender data, uh, uh, the, the kind of information that uh, Elizabeth and her team are, are, are collecting, um, if, there is, uh, if there is information in there on uh, intra-household uh, violence, um, if it's known that it's in certain villages, this is more common than in other villages, yeah, that's something that, uh, that, is, uh, that can have repercussions on those communities uh, uh, as a whole, as a whole, so you need to be really, really careful about how uh, that kind of data is made uh, is made uh, is made available. Um, these kind of this this kind these kind of issues around uh, data sharing uh, around um, 
um, uh, the sensitivity of data, the data confidentiality and privacy, um, it's obviously a hot topic, not just within research. I mean, uh, um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal from uh, from two, year, uh, two years ago uh, and um, um, the ongoing scandals that, uh, that hit the, the headlines uh, um, uh, every other week uh, uh, on data breaches, et cetera, uh, highlight the importance of these types, uh, these types of issue, uh, these types of issues, and um, that is uh, part and parcel of the responsible data management. Um, do do any of you, uh, the other panelists want to add on to that? One thing we are doing is, uh, you know, we are constantly trying to share this data set with uh, government agencies so that they can take immediate measures based on our data set. So we are discussing on how, how we can do this. So it, this may be an avenue where uh, we can confidentially uh, uh, share data, but of course uh, sharing the data publicly has uh, its own implications as Gideon explained. So we are also being careful in not disclosing any kind of confidential or sensitive data. Yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's three very quick steps. First, you get aggregated results for visualization. So in, in the case of IVR codes, you can get them without an hour, I mean, within an hour. And also Louis, I think, shows this aggregated data, you get it right away. This is the first step. The second That's step, right. there's, there's some time for the researcher to analyze the data, to cure, to, to, yeah, and to make a publication, maybe. So this is, in our sense, at least, is like for at least one year maximum, he can use the raw data before publishing it. And then the, la the, third, the third level would be uh, publishing the data, but it needs to be anonymized data and it needs to be taking into consideration the, the privacy issue of, of data. So it's, for me, it's the three levels. First, quick aggregated visualization, uh, data analysis for research purposes, and then the, the anonymized data put it to the public. And one for Mark, is the ROMES tool available for researchers outside CG? Um, and are permissions needed? Um, yeah, so uh, it's publicly available. So we, during that data publication, we also made the survey tool and the analysis codes uh, publicly available. And we recently developed a, what you could call do-it-yourself uh, approach to ROMES. So there you can download as well from the website if you fill in a little form. You can download the whole the whole package uh, in terms of the survey tool, the codes and everything, the ODK definition file of the survey, etc. And then you can use it uh, yourself for your own uh, for your own purposes. We would like to to sort of stimulate that people also share the data with us so that the the, the database keeps on uh, keeps on growing. But that's always the decision of the user uh, themselves. Yeah, so it's it's open access and people can use it as they uh, as they want. And um, is there an effort to harmonize surveys between the CG and the World Bank LSMS program? And especially with the current COVID-19 surveys uh, the World Bank are conducting? Um, I know there's an ongoing effort at IFPRI uh, to put together some questions related to the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index that can be retrofitted to an LSMS type survey. So that's ongoing work. So the idea is that a lot of these data are already collected at a plot level, say on decision-making or who's the manager of the plot. And so what are some of the additional questions from the WEA that are missing from an LSMS type survey that can be added? to calculate uh, the WEA index for an LSMS type survey. So there are some um, coordinated efforts going on. I'm not aware of any related to COVID-19 uh, research specifically, but perhaps some of the other panelists can speak to that. Well, we have- Go ahead. 
Um, yeah, so the within the community of practice, uh, we have been working on um, uh, data harmonization and data standardization. Um, we put out a report last year uh, where Mark is the lead author, um, which is ba was based on uh, on work in which we uh, we uh, uh, we had the input from FAO and World Bank uh, from the, the uh, from the uh, the LSMS ISA team in the World Bank and the, uh, the micro uh, micro level survey teams from FAO uh, in terms of well what makes sense in terms of data harmonization and standardization. Um, while there is a lot of interest, uh, it's we're still a long ways from uh, from having all these different data sets inter, uh, interop, uh, interoperable. That's a short answer. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have uh, uh, a local consultative working group with FAO and World Bank and World Food Program. So we they are all are aware of our ongoing surveys and also from other uh, CG centers. Uh, we are trying to harmonize uh, surveys of FAO with our, our surveys. So th there is an active discussion with uh, non-CGR partners here in the country. Uh, that's what I want to share. Okay. and. Um... Elizabeth, there were a couple of questions about gender sensitivity. So it was just around how do you go about asking if women are on speakerphone or not? And uh, another one was uh, a researcher who interviews women uh, that are part of a savings group and um, asked them about their opinion regarding their participation in the group. And they were just wondering if you had any uh suggestions on how to adapt these kind of questions um regarding the first question i don't remember the exact wording but we ask something like you know we're having a bit of trouble hearing you is the phone on speaker or something along those lines and then they would respond yes or no and we, we, we ask, you know, is it possible to switch the speakerphone off? And if they say no, then we don't ask those questions. So we don't, you know, indicate that, you know, there's a problem with it being on speakerphone. We just, you know, are asking, you know, to know whether or not it is. Um, in terms of the second question, I'm not sure I, I got the whole question. You were breaking up a little bit. Okay, I think it was about how you the use of speakers as a challenge you were talking about. And then uh, she just wanted some, uh, an opinion on, on how you can adapt these kind of questions, I think, in a, in a yeah. So I'll read it out. Uh, Dr. Brian mentioned about uh, the use of speakers as a challenge. So I think the speakerphone there, and then she's saying basically the same question how do you adapt these type of questions while you're on the speakerphone mm -hmm. uh so you'll kind of get the same answers but, but maybe yeah I, I think we just are planning to train the enumerators that if they click yes or perhaps we could even program it into the survey cto uh, form that if they click yes they're on speakerphone that it skips questions related to inter-household conflict uh, just so that none of the sensitive questions are asked for someone who is um, not able to answer them in private. Okay. And there's a few questions about kind of like a cost benefit evaluation or indication of cost between uh, voice versus IVR, um, for example. So if anyone can maybe talk about that. I can quickly talk about IVR. So taking into consideration that um, you are kind of uh, limited in how many questions and how compl complex the questions can be, but you can do, um, you can do a high numbers of, of, of calls, like between five to 10,000, 
and you get relative low costs. So it, it's it's cost effective when you are not try to to get to a very complex service. I think when it's getting more complex service, it's it's more more effective to to switch to phone interviews uh, on with call centers or with callers. Uh, but in the case of, of the, the advantage of IVR, one of the advantages of, of IVR calls is that they are much lower in costs. This depends obviously on country and, and differences, but normally you go through a local telecom provider and, and you just pay the, the local airtime for your call. And if you keep your call below five minutes and you have one cent per call, so you can make a short calculation how much for 5,000 farmers, for example, it would be. So it's, it's, it can be between a few hundred to a few thousand dollars, depending on what number you, you need to collect data. But um, yeah, that's for the IDR code. I don't know if anybody wants to give some experience on the interviews. Um, well, there was also a follow-up question to you, to you, Anton, as well. Um, and someone said, I understand that a 5Q approach complement the monitoring and evaluation and impact assessment, but most development projects do not apply both M and E and impact assessment. Do you recommend to apply the 5Q approach to small development projects? Yeah, that's a that's a discussion that's very important. So as I said, it's 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 suitable for for doing short and simple service. So if you do a baseline for a longer project, you need to do a proper baseline. So maybe ROM is is better suited to do the baseline, and but it, and 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 then you have an impact assessment. Obviously, it needs to be proper design. So Five Q is obviously not doing your impact assessment, but it's very helpful for getting very frequent uh, recurring uh, feedback from what is happening on the ground. So you get like, if you plan a three year project, you have a baseline, you have a end line. So you can in between that time, you can get, you can collect a lot of very relevant information that helps you to improve your project implementation and gives you more better insights for making decisions. So it's not the big data collection of baselines, but it's like the learning from from the implementation and improving as you go okay um and there's something uh, just a bit wider if you think about it the cg relies on thousands of surveys each year to deliver research and impact a lot of face-to-face -face and focus groups how do you see that uh, data collection will change post COVID 19, the post COVID 19 pandemic? Yeah, I think it already changed because we need to be more virtual. <laughs> and this is a challenge because we have, we have discussed this in, in this discussion that obviously you cannot cover every sensitive question uh, doing a phone call. But I think at least uh, in this uh, current phase where we are, it's, it's helpful to, to gather more information through virtual tools and, and combine them what you normally do in fieldwork. So fieldwork, I think fieldwork will, will be less in the future, like data collection in the field, or it will be um, uh, like supported by digital tools better than we did it in the past. So I think this is a, a big step for us to use these tools because they have been developed in recent years for different um, yeah different institutions so we all developed or used our digital tools now it's the best moment to get efficient like to was we what we're currently doing harmonize our tools our data and and go into a more more effective data collection using digital tools in the future and there's uh, other questions about what uh, do you suggest as the process for harmonization um, especially now during COVID-19 and are, the, are the, all of these question, questionnaires that you've discussed publicly available um, for the purpose of standardizing questions, maybe a bit of information about where they can get them or get access to them? Well, the Romus uh, approach is uh, is open access, as Mark already mentioned. Um, we can definitely look into 
uh, how we can better share these tools um, uh, with uh, with other researchers interested in you uh, in, uh, in using them um, and um, as part of our uh, ongoing efforts for uh, data uh, uh, data harmonization and standardization um, and uh, ensuring interoperability uh, so that data can be actionable um, it's uh, it certainly is a, a key component uh, of sharing the kind of the the, uh, the instruments uh, that are uh, that are be, being uh, that are being used um, we don't have an, uh, a repository uh, available yet, uh, but it is definitely something that uh, that we should be uh, uh, we should start wor uh, working on to ensure that it is available for those who are interested. Um, we've run over time already, so um, uh, unless there are really really burning questions that need to be need to be answered. Um, uh, urgently right now, um, Matt. Is there anything in there that uh, that uh, that need uh, that needs to be answered now? Otherwise, we can um, uh, I, we can. I think uh, yeah. I think Go that ahead. we can follow up with a lot of these questions maybe uh, in in some communications after you know yeah. in a newsletter or something. But there is a lot of talk about uh, the use of ontologies and that, and how how it can be used to harmonize. Okay. So maybe it's something we can all also yeah, respond sure. to yeah. after. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. Let me let me uh, uh, in closing uh, in closing this webinar um, mention that uh, within the community of practice on socioeconomic data we have a working group uh, on uh, on ontology uh, on ontologies and we are developing a um, socioeconomic ontology in order to. Uh, tag uh, house, uh, household surveys to begin with, but broader than that, to tag socioeconomic data in order to make uh, to make uh, uh, to to enhance inter uh, interoperability. Uh, this is a work in progress. We expect that before the summer, our first version of uh, CIOT, uh, the socioeconomic ontology, uh, will be published. Um, uh, just stay tuned to the community of practice and. Uh, uh, and you will get uh, you will get uh, you will get the latest uh, updates on, uh, on that. If you're really interested in contributing to the uh, to the development of the socioeconomic ontology, uh, ontology just drop uh, uh, drop us uh, drop us an email, and um, uh, uh, and we'll get in we'll get in touch we'll get in touch with you. Um, I'd like to really thank the uh, the five panelists who were with us uh, today: uh, Louis, Elizabeth, uh, Amjad, Mark, and Anton. Thank you very much for your time. Um, not all of our listeners realize that for some of them it is early. It was early in the morning, and others late at night because we're located across the across the globe. Um, and um, um, as I said uh, in the introduction, we are planning to hold uh, further webinars on this topic uh, related to some of the more technical aspects of, uh, of phone interview, uh, interviews. Uh, we already touched upon some of those issues uh, through the interactive voice response um, uh, issues that uh, that uh, Anton men uh, mentioned, but we'll go into that a little bit more deeper uh, in a in a follow up webinar uh, or somewhere over the yeah w uh, next two, two weeks. The announcement will be uh, will be made. Uh, we also plan to do uh, to hold uh, a, a webinar uh, more specifically on uh, on the ethical uh, the ethical issues. Uh, of uh, of phone uh, phone in, uh, phone interviews, um, and with that, I would like to uh, uh, to cl uh, close off the uh, this webinar. Thank you very much for attending.